Welcome, welcome, welcome. A notable welcome to all you music lovers. To something that what I like to call Journey to the Stage. It's all about music. Music. And more music. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back your host. Your host. And our dad. Brian. Frazier. Frazier. Oh, Captain. My Captain. Welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you found this podcast in this episode. And special thanks to my very special friend, San Antonio musical and instrumental artist, Chris Taylor, for letting me use his wonderful song, Arise and Shine, as my podcast theme song. Chris can turn any surface into a canvas, and he has a large online gallery full of many pieces for sale. And he also takes commissions on top of his art. You can check out his great music at ChrisTaylorWorld.com. And I personally have over 50 albums by Chris in my music library. So you could say that I love his music and I know that you will too if you check it out. If you would have asked 13 year old me what I wanted to do when I grew up, I would have said I wanted to be a rock star. I I love rock. My brother turned me on to bands like Zeppelin and the whole world of rock and roll. But before rock entered my life, I had the pleasure of hearing so much great music, music that my mom played. And I know that she's listening, so hi mom. So much of that music was acoustic. Uh, Gordon Lightfoot, who just passed away, John Denver, Simon and Garfunkel, and from them and many, many others, I developed a love for acoustic music. In that vein, I'm excited to welcome to Journey to the Stage singer and songwriter, Jamie Harris. Before Jamie and I start our chat, if you would consider leaving a kind review wherever you listen to this podcast or give a rating, share it with other people in your life who love beautiful music. It would be such a big help to this indie podcaster. And for every positive review, Jamie and I will get matching tattoos of your name. (laughs) Of course, that's a joke. Uh, Careful. I have followed through with many tattoo dares in my lifetime. So (laughs) we will have to hear those stories. (laughs) So ensconced in the artist's throne today is Jamie Harris, who just dropped her second full-length album. Oh, I should say her second full-length studio album. She's got a live album as well and some EPs and singles. And I can tell you that if you love beautiful melodies, thoughtful and thought-provoking lyrics, and love listening to a voice that is just lovely, you are going to love Jamie's new album. So Jamie, I am so glad you joined me today. Welcome. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Before we get too far, I want to thank our mutual friend, Sarah Bennett, for connecting us. Sarah is, um, as you probably well know, is a a delightful person. I really, really appreciate her so much. Same. What an angel. Yes. So as I was preparing for our chat, I learned that you and I kind of share in a great tragedy because you turned 30 during the lockdown and I turned 50 during the lockdown and I still feel ripped off. (laughs) Because, <laughs> you know, nobody wants to come to 51. How have you uh, recovered from such a monumental birthday get, getting kind of glossed over in the lockdown? You know what's funny is I don't think I had really considered age so much. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like, a, oh, we're going to miss this like great passing and time to acknowledge my 30th birthday. Because a lot of times I'm on the road <laughs> on my birthday anyways. Or yeah, I don't know. It's like I... I The thing that makes me so excited about my birthday that will never change is that I always share it with the great Emmylou Harris. So oh wow, that's always a celebration for me because I'm such a nearly psychotic fan of Emmylou Harris that it just feels like so cool to share a birthday with her. Yeah, well, it's funny because when when I hit 50, it was the first time I thought, I have more life behind me than I have ahead of me. It was kind of eye-opening and it really, I think, has has changed my perspective and helped me mm-hmm. to appreciate moments and conversations and people. The smaller things, I think, are a little more important to me. So, you know, it is interesting how we age does factor into our personality, our perspective. Of course it does, but it's just kind of interesting to observe that. So, That's yeah, beautiful. we kind of do share that tragedy. I do think like another thing that is probably, uh, you know, I, I know I share with a lot of people that are also in recovery. I've been in recovery from uh, alcohol and drug addiction for over nine years. And wow, so beautiful. every day, Congratulations. thank you. I got a lot of help and it was, That's it's awesome. a miracle, but I, um, I also feel like every day is like a bonus round because mm-hmm. in so many ways I should totally be dead and I'm not. So every day is like, wow, wow I can't believe I'm still on earth. And uh, Wow. So well, that's really interesting yeah. you say that because I've seen that you've you've 
done a lot of dates with Mary Gaucher, mm-hmm. who also came from addiction and hit bottom, as you well know her. You know her story probably better than I do. That's that's really neat. You guys must have a lot of very interesting conversations on the road. We do. I don't know if you know this, but we're life partners as well. Uh, we do have a lot of conversations about it every yeah. day, about recovery and gratitude and um, and a lot of joy that we can do this together. Like if you had asked me six years ago, if I thought in a million years I would end up with a singer songwriter, I would have told you you're out of your mind. So you've dropped your second album and you've been touring, play, playing lots of places. How's it going on the road so far? How are you feeling about uh, this album kind of entering the the ethos, so to speak? It's been cool. I think my suspicion was right about this record, which was it's not going to be a lightning bolt. It's kind of a slow burn. And there are people Mm -hmm. that didn't necessarily get on the ride at the very beginning, which to me feels like Mm -hmm. eons ago. But that was really only this record came out like barely three months ago. So I really two and a half months ago, which feels like, gosh, forever now in musician years. But Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so there are people that are now discovering it. And that's really exciting for me. I've never been more proud of a batch of songs ever. And as far as taking it to the stage, being on the road with it, I mean, a lot of where this record came from was, like you said, I've been touring with Mary Gaucher quite a bit. And when I first started playing, I played in a duo with my dad. And then I was in a trio and bands for years. And it wasn't until I finally quit my day job and decided to go full time as an artist and went on the road that I realized being on stage with an acoustic guitar completely alone, that I had never done that before in all my years of playing. And it was terrifying. And I really had wow. to be, be, get totally broken down and learn a whole new skill set. The troubadour skill set is a different skill set than being a band leader and letting right. music kind of fill the space in between. A lot of reasons I started writing, or one of the biggest reasons is because I have a difficult time connecting with my speaking words. And so writing gives me this opportunity to connect and say, really what I felt like I meant to say or what I want to say in this very thought through form and process. And so having to talk in between songs, I was like, this is my worst nightmare, like public speaking. (laughs) Oh no. Like I didn't want to do this. It is for most people. Oh, exactly. And so, but part of the problem too, is that I didn't really have the songs for that kind of uh, representation. Right. Hmm. And so Emerging with this batch of songs, which the pandemic allowed me, the lockdown phase of it allowed me to spend a lot of time working on these. And some of them were songs that really dropped in many years ago, but I hadn't had enough life experience to finish them. And so now emerging from the pandemic with this batch of songs, I feel a lot stronger. But initially, it was a little bumpy because the other complication is, okay, now for minus two years of being in the house, I've been an opening act. So I've been playing 30 minutes for about four years. So now I have to do it 90 minutes of this. And initially it was like, okay, how do I do that? And I feel every time I I do it, I feel a lot stronger, but I'm still, there's so much variety in the type of touring that I do now. Like, okay, bounce. I'm an opening act for three or four days. Boom. Now I'm doing 90 minute shows by myself. Now I'm in a collaborative thing with Tim O'Brien. Like, it really has been been a lot and it's been really good because it's made me so much stronger because I've had to adapt very quickly to those different environments. And so I have way more skills now. You're right. I mean, not, to fill 90 minutes, to hold people's attention for 90 minutes, that could be a challenge. And, you know, it's what, probably 20 songs or so. I mean, that's a pretty decent set of music you're having to come up with. Yeah. And one thing that's been really cool about doing the solo sets is that I can play songs differently every time because I don't have the side people playing with me right now. Oh, right. And right. that's been really fun. And one thing that I really love to do is to sing other people's songs, which I haven't been able to do a lot in an opening set. And so I'm able to right. bring in different songs and that's been really fun. And one thing that I think we don't naturally do as singer songwriters or as artists, I think we have a natural tendency to take a song that, I don't know, Jackson Brown wrote or Bob Dylan wrote and reimagine it um, and make it our own. But we don't really experiment with our own songs that way. And a couple of months even into this process, like I've accidentally figured out in a green room an entirely different version of the fair and dark haired lad that I've been bringing in live. And so giving myself the freedom to to do that has been really fun to keep it interesting uh, for myself, because if I'm bored, I think the audience is going to be bored. That's really, really interesting. I know there are some artists that, especially if they have an extensive career, well, I think of Paul Simon, 
he loves to rearrange his songs. And Mm -hmm. I think he does it for the reason you're talking about. So it keeps it fresh and interesting for him. And as the listener who's heard a song, you know, umpteen times, like, okay, that's a little spicy. I like that. Another one is Robert Plant. You know, when he does Mm -hmm. Zeppelin songs, he often will change the arrangement. And again, it's like, this song's 40, 50 years old or whatever. Let's let's mix it up a little bit and add some new new flavor to it. So that's really cool that you're experimenting with your own music that way. Keeps it fresh. Absolutely. So we're going to be digging into um, Boomerang Town, your new album. And it, and it is really just a beautiful, beautiful album. We're going to play a couple cuts from it here. But I want to know what it was for you when you were starting out, when you stood at the edge of that road, the artist road, what was it that made you want to take that first step and say, this this is something I want to pursue. You know, I've been wanting to do this since I was about five years old. And I, wow. I was, I really came to me quite young. And I think some of that was that my dad played in a cover band to put himself through college and high school. I mean, through college and law school. Um, when I was young, my parents had me quite young. But I think as I learned more about myself and the desire to do it, I think more is revealed to me. I think some of it was just very in- instinctive. Like, I heard Amy Lou Harris and I said, whatever that is, I want to be a part of that. I saw Patty Griffin and Buddy Miller and Julie Miller live. And I said, whatever that is, I want to be a part of that. That means being a songwriter. Okay, cool. What I've learned recently is that really connection. I've always had friends, but I've never really fit into one group. But And music has always allowed me to connect. When I was in high school, I would make these little mixtapes and they would get passed around the school. Like people would make copies of copies like, sorry. You know, I have paid for plenty of music in my life, but you know, that, and that allowed me to like communicate without, once again, without using my speaking words. Where was it? I moved to Grapevine, Texas, which is a suburb of Dallas, only for a couple of years. I remember these, there were these three very popular blonde girls and they wanted to play wide open spaces at the talent show, but they couldn't find a karaoke track of it. And I happened to overhear this conversation. I said, well, I know how to play that song on the guitar. Like I could play guitar for you. And so I think I quickly figured out in a way that I could also use my skills yeah. to like help me survive and not get like the sh- kicked out of me in school yeah. emotionally. But I also think that unconsciously or subconsciously that I knew that music would be my way, my gateway into seeing the world. That's really, really interesting. If you if you were to look back maybe at some of your earliest days, are there any artists bands, styles, genres that that you heard growing up that you think have really kind of continued to impact you and to shape you as as an artist, as a songwriter, singer, musician? Yeah, I think, you know, Fleetwood Mac was definitely one of the the first yeah. bands where I said, I don't care if I'm Lindsey Buckingham or Stevie Nicks, but like <laughs> that, I think made me want to be on stage and the harmonies. I have a super love of harmonies. Of course, Emmy Lou Harris, and I was born in 1990. So the con- we didn't have an independent record store where I grew up. So the concept of liner notes was a little bit foreign to me. So it wasn't until I was a teenager and went to a record store. The first thing I did was like, what? They have Amy Lou Harris records here. And I like looked through them and I saw that, wait a minute, like who's Towns Van Zant? Who is Graham Parsons? Like she did, you know, or like she didn't write some of these songs. Like the idea that the singer and the songwriter weren't the same person hadn't occurred to me. Oh, that right. first Chicks record, like who, who is Patty Griffin? Who is Susan Gibson? You know, like, wait a minute. And so that, that was really mind blowing to me because I was already writing songs by that point. But I think one of the most formative artists for me in so many ways was and continues to be Patty Griffin. Uh, there's something just about, I had about 40 seconds of the song called Forgiveness on her first record, Living With Ghosts. That was once again, sorry, I've mm. now bought this record probably 10 times, but um, was- <laughs> And she Ali- thinks you. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it was it was downloaded uh, off the internet, you know, in, the, one of, in the, you know, those days. And so I only had 40 seconds of it and I didn't know what was happening, but I just felt like, wow, mm. like whatever this sound is, I love this. And so Patty was a huge, huge, huge inspiration to me. And I've been really diving in and listen, listening to a lot of her work again, because I have this aspiration of, you know, kind of want to have a flaming red moment, meaning right after she put out that incredible acoustic solo record, she made a full on rock record. Mm. Um, and I, like you mentioned, you love rock and roll. I love rock and yeah. roll as well. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and listening to that, I was like, 
I keep listening to it every time I get in my car. I'm trying to, you know, get get something from it that hasn't yeah. fully downloaded into my consciousness yet. Mm-hmm. Um, but she's been a huge inspiration for me. And also, you know, Amy Lou Harris, one of the things that I love so much, not just about her artistry and her voice and the incredible songwriters that she's brought into a bigger platform is that I really love being a collaborator. I love perhaps equally, if not more than being a front person as being a side person, singing harmonies, participating in bands. Like there's a band I sing with quite often called Restos, where I get to be kind of like a either Emmylou Harris with the band or like Stevie Nicks with the Heartbreakers. And that's a lot of fun for me. I need to have all those outlets to feel artists like creatively fulfilled. And Emmylou Harris has been able to do that really successfully to collaborate with other artists, remain you know, doing her own thing, also caring for it, a beautiful tradition, but experimenting with new sounds. And I just love, love, love her. 2018 Red Rescue, that's your your first album comes out. And now that you've got a little distance from that album and just having put out, you're uh, putting out Boomerang Town. How, how do you think you've maybe developed as a writer, as, a, as an artist, as a, as a troubadour, what kind of changes have you seen in yourself kind of between these two albums? Well, Red Rescue was a combination of a lot of songs that I written over, you know, many years and had the chance to workshop them live with the band. And even so, I think when I went in with a producer, wonderful producer, Craig Ross, I think we recorded 15 songs at the beginning and it took us like three years to make that record. And we got to a certain point when he said, you know what, you still need two songs you don't have the songs yet for this record. And I was like, what? And he was right. Like to make that record a record was, you know, that made sense. And I was like, okay. And and I'm really glad that he tasked me with doing that because he was right. But I think I was really so much in the, just that fire that you have in your early twenties. And I, you know, I, I was very recently sober. So I was still very much thinking about myself, myself, my problems, you know, what's going on. And, and which of course is, you know, it, they're the deeply personal is universal. And, and so there's a lot to that. But I think the difference between that record and this re- record is that I've really thought of myself more as a writer, meaning that I have the ability, the permission and the responsibility to create narrators and that these songs are sung from the perspective of narrators. And even if the narrator is me, it's me 10 minutes ago. It's me three years ago. It's me 20 years ago. And just having that little bit of distance has allowed me to go deeper with stories. And also one of the things that I think was really helpful about being out there alone on stage with an acoustic guitar is to go like, well, here's a song about my depression, or I figured out other ways to talk about, Hey, (laughs) did you know that Oklahoma incarcerates more women per capita than any state in the country? And here's an opportunity to talk about women in recovery, which is an organization in Tulsa. That's an alternative to prison for women who are in recovery and then play a song that I wrote in early recovery. Like I did figure out how to like, cause I'm like, wow, talking about myself so much, like this is an ego trip. This is boring. This is not good. I don't want to hear about me. These strangers that came not to see me certainly don't want to hear about me. So I think I did go through it through a lens of like, how can I use this to talk about issues that matter to me or things that are keeping me awake at night, but not through the eye perspective that's Jamie Harris. Right, right. Well, and too, you know, I think by choosing a narrator, sometimes they can help a heavier topic not to come across so heavily or maybe to sound so preachy or so boxy. It, it gives you a little bit of distance from that. So I could see how the employment of a of a narrator perspective could could give you that freedom. One of the most powerful things I think about songs is that we have this very natural human tendency to create our own story and to make up a movie in our minds. Or like, you know, when you read a book and you you visualize what these characters look, look like and you create this whole world, songs can do that in three and a half to five minutes. And then the listener is able to have their own emotional response, which is created by this world that they visualize in their mind as they're listening to the song. Music is surprisingly impressionistic, and I've I've talked with other writers about this. How I was, in fact, I was just talking with uh, with Glenn Phillips from Toad the Wet Sprocket, and he talked about this about how letting you can't force it. You kind of have to let the song go in the direction in the direction it wants to go. Because if you're trying to enforce a meaning into it, you're going to stifle the capability of the listener to maybe hear themselves in that song. And I thought, wow, that's pretty pretty interesting. That I so agree with that. I think 
try my experience has certainly been the same as you know glenn phillips awesome you know who <laughs> i've been following his house tour with casey turner for the past month <laughs> like loving that following that online love casey turner too but yeah i i totally agree with that and because i think there's so much more wisdom in the song than the songwriter so if my experience has been if i go oh man i really wanted to write a song about this and the song goes er, we're not doing that we're writing about this and i follow right. it then what I've learned is that five years later, six years later, I go, oh my gosh, this is like, this contained way more than I thought when I wrote it. And if I had imposed my will on it, I would have made it so much smaller. No, that's that's really interesting. That's very insightful. I want to play a song from the album. Uh, so we're going to play the title track, Boomerang Town. Tell us about this. It seems, you know, fairly autobiographical at least it, or personal but again it probably comes from a, a narrator perspective give us a little bit of insight and then we're going to check it out yeah so i've been wanting to write a song to explain where i grew up forever because it's a very difficult thing to explain where i grew up because it's not a small enough town to be a small town it's not big enough to be a city you know this is a song like i really wanted to write for for many 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 years but what really happened was um i became a woody guthrie fan kind of later in life for a folk singer. But I did, a, my, a good friend of mine who's a tremendous songwriter in Tulsa named John Moreland invited me to this festival in Okima, Oklahoma, which is the Woody Guthrie Folk Festival. And that's how I got into Woody Guthrie. And so I started going to this place in Tulsa called the Woody Guthrie Center, where they have like tons of stuff that Woody left behind after he passed. And one of the things they have there are all of the verses of This Land is Your Land in Woody's handwriting. This verse that really stood out to me is, is what I call the steeple verse. And it goes in the shadow of the steeple. I saw my people by the relief office. I saw my people. They stood there hungry. And so I stood there asking, was this land made for you and me in my hometown? I 35 runs straight through it. And on the East side of I 35, there's a steeple from a seminary there. And on the West side, there's a Caritas relief office and a salvation army. And the interstate actually creates a bridge. And there's a community of people living under that bridge and has been my entire life. So when I read these words that Woody wrote when in the 30s or 40s, I was like, oh my gosh, that's my hometown. And so I deeply yeah. connected with that verse. That's when the seed was planted for me to really write a defense, I guess, of that verse in modern times and to explain my hometown and talk about narrators. I tried so many different narrators. I tried writing from the perspective of a veteran that's just returned from the Mideast War. I tried writing it from the perspective of a waitress in a coffee shop and the best perspective I found to most honestly tell the story was from behind the eyes of a 17 year old boy who works at Walmart. That's just knocked up his girlfriend. Wow. That's very interesting. Well, let's check this out. This is Boomerang Town, the title track by the album of the same name from Jamie Harris.
Very, very beautifully done, Jamie. You have 
you have a real gift for writing it wonderfully melodic. Uh, it's such a beautiful song. And uh, tell me, so maybe some of those songwriters that that you look up to. You, you've mentioned a few people, Emma Lou and and others. Are there any other songwriters that you find inspiration in? Oh, big time. And Eliza Gilkison, huge fan. Um, Gretchen Peters, I think she's tremendous. Um, I'm a huge Towns Van Zant fan as well. I love Butch Hancock. I love Nick Cave. So as I was doing my research, did I come across a picture of you in Bonnie Whitmore? I love Bonnie Whitmore. Okay. Yes. I thought, but I couldn't find the picture again because <laughs> I had, I had her and Eleanor on uh, when they dropped their, their album together. One of the things I read about you is that you have spent a lot of time studying the craft of songwriting. What does that look like? And, and what do you think you've taken away from that time that you've spent in study of the craft? Yeah. You know, I didn't really start studying the craft until 20, 20- 17. And the way that that worked is there's another artist that I love tremendously and miss every day. His name was Jimmy LaFave. I don't know if you're familiar with Jimmy. He was an incredible interpreter of songs as well as a songwriter. He taught me so much. He would do this thing like every night. He never had a set list. And he would play songs in a different key or a different tempo every night to bring forth a different emotion. Extraordinary. But I was really fortunate to get to know Jimmy in the, the last few years of his life. And um, I wanted to go to the songwriting workshop, which was hosted by Eliza Gilkison, super fan of her, and Gretchen Peters, I mentioned both of them, and Mary Gaucher. And I was aware of Mary because I'd heard her name in a Ray Wiley Hubbard song called Name Dropping, but I I wasn't really familiar like with Mary's music so much. And um, some, uh, but I couldn't go. They were doing this workshop in Texas because it was around the time Jimmy was dying. There was just some stuff related to that and I couldn't go. And so some fans and friends of mine raised the money for me to go to a workshop in New Mexico that was hosted by the three of them. And that was actually really the first time that I had brought any of my songs to a workshop or had attended a songwriting workshop after, I don't know, 24 years of writing. Is that right? No, that math is wrong. I started, I think 13 years before I can't, you know, word person, not math person. We'll go with a long time. A long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, (laughs) I wish that I had done it so much sooner because there were Mm. things that I was doing instinctively in my writing Mm -hmm. that they were able to help highlight for me. So now when I go into a co-write, there are certain things that I, I know to do now that help the process along, or when I get stuck, certain things I can, I can do and bring forth. And I think it's just a really good idea to, to bring your songs to a songwriting workshop, because you know what I noticed is that a lot of professional songwriters or people who are doing this as a job have never done that. I think it's good to know, like, you know, if there's something that's working, then lean into it. But if there's something that's not working in your work and you don't understand why, yeah. where, where you might be bucking your listeners off, I think it's good to get some perspective around that. Well, it is interesting. And I think there is so much to be learned by listening in music and conversation and everything. And I, you're right. There is, there are so many great writers out there and to sometimes, and you have the, the acumen to be able to, to pick apart a song better than I would and say, Oh, okay. I can see what they did there and incorporate some of that into your own writing, those types of ideas. That's, that's really, really neat. And I, I was curious about the, the title. What does boomerang town mean? Does it have a, a meaning to it? Yeah. I remember being at a party when I first moved to Austin within my first year. And I used to go to these parties at this guy, Josh Halverson's house. It was really fun. It was always like the late of the latest night folks. We would watch the sun come up together, that kind of thing, pass the guitar around on a weekday. And uh, someone was asking me to describe Waco to them who had never experienced that they weren't from Texas. And I said, well, it's kind of like a boomerang town because it feels like a lot of people that try to leave end up coming back pretty quick. I want to play another song. I want to play uh, Missing Someone. This is a, a jaunty kind of mid-tempo song. Tell us a little bit about this. Is this uh, autobiographical? Is it kind of a composition of this you know, narrator that you're talking about? Give us a little bit of insight before we listen. Yeah, I. Uh, this is the last song on the record, which I've told folks, I think you can really mm-hmm. start the record with Boomerang Town and end on Missing Someone, or you can start with like, Sam's and end on like boomerang town. Like you can kind of go through this whole like cycle in yeah. a bunch of different ways. You have a different experience no matter where you start the record. It's, yeah. yeah. This song I wrote very early on in my relationship with Mary and we could not stay in one place long enough to, to send each other postcards 
So we started writing each other these songs and sending them back and forth. I like love, you know, love this song and just like the, the, the funness of it. But this song came from one of those times and I wasn't sure if it was going to make the record. And then it took on like a whole other meaning. I had this incredible opportunity to play for the women in the Gatesville women's prison, which is the prison just like 20 minutes outside of my hometown. And I realized this whole concept of missing someone was very different for women who were in prison and they were like loving I think I played it twice they were like play it again like play it again and so I was like okay wow this thing that I thought was just like a simple little love song can be used for a higher purpose that I had no idea when I wrote it that's a beautiful song let's hit play this is Missing Someone by Jamie Harris from her latest album Boomerang Town So something I really, really appreciate about uh, Boomerang Town is that it's it's a very complete album. It's an album that that I can play from top to bottom um, because it really is a wonderful collection of songs. And I, I think the the writing is for every song. I mean, it's just just so well done. And and I think it's it's an album that you should feel really, really proud of. How 
now that it's out, it's been out for a little bit, how has your perspective on it changed that these songs have been received by people? And just, you know, what, what's your thinking about it now that you've got a little bit of distance between the release of it for these songs that you carried and crafted and honed for such a long period of time. I'm really, really proud of these songs and I'm proud of this record. And there's this Woody Guthrie quote. It's like, it's the job of the folk singer to comfort the disturbed. And you do that by disturbing the comfortable. So I like that. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. And so I will say like, you know, when I was, I, I pretty much knew I wanted the guy who made this record phenomenal producer named Mark Hallman. I love him so much. And I, I, he was my number one choice. And, uh, you know, because I'm in Nashville and because the whole deal, like, you know, I was like, well, maybe I should interview, you know, I should interview some other producers and see what's up. And there was a producer that said to me, um, he's like, I don't want to make a record this sad after what we've just been through. And I was like, okay. And I, I appreciated the honesty. And I also like, and to me, I'm thinking like, I think there's so much hope in this record because yeah, I do too. For me, it's like, I'm not alone. Like there are other people that have had this experience. There are other people that are going, going through this, you know, this record wasn't going to be for everyone, but my hope was that it would find the people that would get it. And there's a lot of art that's like made for escapism and there's a total place for that. And that's beautiful. And I love it. And I mean, I, I will put on Hanson in my car all the time, like ready to jam, like, (laughs) you know, and just other stuff. Like I, I'm into it. Get your mbop on. (laughs) Got my mbop, got my man from Milwaukee on. Like I got some deep cuts, you know, there you go. And, uh, you know, not that Hanson's that escapism, but you know, you know what I mean? Like there's just some yeah, stuff that's, that's there sure. for fun. And, yeah. and, uh, but yeah, I think I, I really was solid around the idea knowing that there were people that were going to go, oh, this record is sad and just not get it. And that's been the, ex- you know, the experience. Some people went, well, I don't understand, you know, why it has to, why does she have to be so sad or why is it? And I think that, and I could be wrong, but I do think there is something where it's a little more difficult to hear songs like this coming from a woman. You know, oh, if wow. Steve Earle had put it out, if it was Towns Van Zant came back from the grave and like put out a collection, people would be like, wow, you know, Towns is back with these, you know, these sad songs, these dark songs. I think hmm. that there's a there is a bias that it, and it's not conscious. I don't think it's a conscious thing, but I think there is something that it's OK for women to sing songs about sad songs about love or unrequited love. Or, you know, kind of beating themselves up in a way. I don't think it's cool for them, you know, cool, quote, to point to yeah. different norms in this way, in this tradition of songwriting. Interesting. I think instead of saying like, oh, well, you know, I had someone say, well, it's formulaic, you know, and there's a reason that these formulas work, you know, where if it was a man, they might have said, wow, this person, this young artist is carrying forth the tradition of folk songwriting. Uh, so. Yeah. You know, but Mm. what, what's been so great about that is like, instead of being bothered by that, I'm just able to go, yeah, these songs just might not be your cup of tea, but I, I worked hard on them. And I also, one of the coolest things I've ever done, and I love music, obsessed with music, love going to festivals and conferences and that kind of thing. But the truth is with music conferences, a lot of the conversations are about the business of music. Right. Last year, I got to go to the Tennessee Williams Literary Festival in New Orleans One of the coolest things I've ever done in my life, and it happens at the same time as this other literary conference called the Saints Mm -hmm. and Sinners, which is the only all LGBTQ plus literary conference in the country. And what I learned from those panels, these authors talking about, they're talking about the art. The conferences are more about really the creation of art. How do you bring in a mentor to help you with this specific work Mm -hmm. um, to help you make sure you got the narrator's voice right or you got the place right, all of this stuff. And I, I just, I did bring in some a couple of you know mentors people that i really really trust as yeah. writers and they said yeah these songs are rock solid so yeah. i was able to to really know that i did the best possible job that i could honoring these songs before i released them into the world and that was helpful now if i had gotten the same response in a way to red rescue i think it would have hurt me more because or hurt me really you know it's like oh what if i you know i didn't ask so-and-so, or I, I don't know. It's, it's a tough thing. Cause you want to be secure in your art without like seeking outside validation. But sure. I just have a really strong knowing that I needed to put out this record at this time and to tell this story. And the truth is, is that with red rescue, when I wrote those songs, I kind of wrote my way through a lot of the experiences attached to those songs. Yeah. With this record, it's shown me where I've got to do more work in my life. Okay, it's time to get into therapy and deal with some of the stuff that you haven't shed because you don't want to hold a resentment against a lifestyle that, you know, that was important to you in your early years of life. You want to be able to take the lessons from that and set free the resentment. 
you know, I need to do work around some of my, you know, I have alcoholism all through my family. Yeah. Same and way. have I really done work looking at that? I haven't. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so this record has been a, a gift in telling me how, showing me how to get stronger in my life. Yeah. And no one can take that away from me. No one can take yeah. those lessons away from me, regardless if you think it's too sad or, oh. you know, formula. You're absolutely right. <laughs> and, I, and I can relate to, you know, alcoholism took my dad and his dad. So there's a, mm. there's a long, uh, and destructive line of that. So I, I can relate. So before we wrap up our time, I want to have a little bit of fun. I want to play a game. It's a terrible name, but I, I thought of this. It was really late. Well, or maybe it was actually early this morning. And um, this is called Jamie with two E's. Tell me, please. It's terrible. I should probably I trademark it. it, but I couldn't think of anything else. And this is some top notch creativity going on right here. So here's yes. what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask a simple question and then you tell me. The first thing that comes to mind, don't overthink it, just let it out, and I can edit out anything that needs to be edited out. <laughs> cool. So, you ready for your first question? Oh, I'm nervous, but yes. Okay, don't be nervous, don't be nervous. So, Jamie with two E's, tell me please, if you could write and perform one song with any artist, living or dead, who would it be? Oh. I know. Yeah, that's a tough one. You know what I would probably want to do is not an artist, but what I would love to do is sit with John Lewis oh, okay, and co-write with John Lewis and perform wow. something with him where he's, I don't know. So what is a movie that you can't stand that almost everybody else loves? A movie that I can't stand that almost everybody else loves. Maybe there isn't one, ah. but I, I have, I have some of my own I, I have bands that i like i can't get into i don't understand it it doesn't connect mm -hmm. and everyone's like oh they're the greatest i'm like mm, i don't say <laughs> it publicly because i don't i don't want to denigrate anybody's right. art but you know it's taste is so individualized a movie that that just doesn't do it for you that everyone else loves you know what i will say one and i think it's it's one that i wish that i got because i am a super fan of horror okay Okay. I love horror movies. And one movie that I think is so wildly loved and is supposedly groundbreaking is a movie called The Thing, the John Carpenter's version of The oh, Thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. And there's something about it that I don't get. And <laughs> okay, it's not that legit. I hate it, but it's just like, what is it that I don't see that everyone yeah. sees that loves this movie? And it feels like every hardcore horror fan loves it, but I don't quite get it. Yeah, that's legit. I, I that's get hard that. to admit, but I don't. I don't get no, it. No, no, no. That's good. <laughs> I, I, I like it. So, so this is some hard hitting journalism right here. Mm -hmm. What is your biggest pet peeve? Well, you're thinking mine is people that chew really loudly. Oh, you'd hate me. I, I and it's so funny. <laughs> okay, not having dinner with Jamie. I my not and I get it from I get it from my dad. My dad, like if we made chewing noises at the table, we instantly would get the we would get the look. <laughs> and so I have unfortunately passed that down to our sons. And so every time they're eating oh. with somebody, they make a sound. They're like, dude, you really need to quiet your eating down. So unfortunately, oh we pass our neurosis down to our children. But do you have any any pet peeves? I'm, I'm trying to think. I'm, You know, it's funny. I um, My partner has a theory because like every time I drink something, like I can probably do an example right here. Let's see. She says it's like incredibly loud. Like, Ouch. it's really, I know. So, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I know. So, but she's like, my friend Betty Sue was staying with us recently and she was swallowing and she's like, it must be a singer thing. Like you guys just have oh, like wow. people that have large mouths. So here's the last question for you. What piece of advice would you give to somebody, an artist who is standing at the beginning of that road where you took your first step? They're standing in that same spot. What would you tell them? Write a mission statement, which can always be edited a few years. But I think in the beginning when you're creating, actually not just in the beginning, but always, there are going to be opportunities that come or people that come into your life that might not align with your mission statement. And if you're clear on what your mission statement is with your, with your art, then I think it stays, then it's a lot easier to stay true to who you are and to operate within that integrity. I think that's really profound. I think if you don't have some solid columns, some solid things to hold on to, it, it becomes easier to compromise and to 
suffer missional drift. And I think that's really profound. I, I really, really like that. Thanks for sharing that. Absolutely. You know, my, my partner did this awesome interview with uh, Brainy Carlisle when my partner put out a book. And, uh, you know, Brainy Carlisle's mission statement, she does a lot of good in the world, but she was very clear. She's like, I want to write songs so that I can sing them and be famous. Like her goal, I would say her goal was to be famous. And her mission statement was, you know, to do that, I think with, I don't know exactly what her mission statement was, you know, but the ultimate goal was to be famous. My goal, I think being famous, like would not be good for me in, in yeah. any way. Sorry yeah, to say to either. anyone that's no. on my team trying to work for me. <laughs> you know, I think a slow, st- like a rocket ship isn't isn't my thing. You know, like my mission statement is is to kind of, you know, like align with Guthrie's to to comfort the disturbed and, mm-hmm. you know, and to to be honest about, you know, my work. And um, anyways, don't want to get too deep into it. But yeah, but I think there's also something like, even if like your mission statement is like attached to being famous, that that's what you want to do, then maybe like, why, why go to a folk conference or do the folk fit? Like, if that's not aligned with what you want to do, then like, you don't have to say yes to every opportunity if it's not connected to your goal. Yeah. And then the bigger idea is the mission statement underneath that goal. Yeah. Well said, well said. So let's talk about how people can support you and keep updated with what's going on. I know that you're on the road right now. You've got more dates. I'm sure that you'll be adding as, as we dig into summer more. Where can people go to get all that information? Yeah. So my website, jamieharris.com, J-A-I-M-E-E harris.com. I'm also sharing a lot on my Patreon page, which is patreon.com slash Jamie Harris. If you don't know what that is, it's kind of like a modern fan club where you can mm-hmm. join for $3 a month at the at the um, smallest amount. And then you get access to a bunch of behind the scenes stuff, like demos, cover videos that I don't post anywhere else. Also. Um, because of where I am in my career, just to be totally honest, I'm very much at the beginning, you know, in a lot of ways, like I just got my first distribution deal. I just got my first booking agent. And there are so many things that because of the algorithm have to look a certain way on Instagram and on Facebook. But if you want the real story of like, for example, here's a picture of me singing with John Prine on the same mic. That was awesome. And it was, but I wasn't supposed to be on that mic. So if you want the real story of how I totally ended up where I maybe quote, wasn't supposed to be, but you know, was in the sense of like, everything happens for a reason. Here's the real story of how I ended up (laughs) on that microphone. I encourage people jump on Patreon, even a few bucks. You go a few bucks a month times X number of people. It can really, really make all the difference between an artist having enough to eat and not having enough to eat. And so, yeah, I think it's a great way. Direct support is really the way to go these days. People don't, okay, so we don't buy albums anymore. I'm going to support Jamie Harris on her Patreon page. And that's, that's how we do it people. So I strongly encourage everybody to do that. And I'll put the links for that in the show notes. So people can just click on that and get that started. So, well, Jamie, it's been really, really great talking to you. I I really enjoyed our chat and uh, thanks for spending part of your day with me today. Same. Thanks for having me, Brian. Yeah. And to each and every one of you listening, I am so grateful for you. Season two of this podcast is going to go up to episode 50, which are all booked. And I and believe it or not, I've already started reaching out to some artists for season three, which will launch in the fall. So stay tuned for that. And another big thank you to Jamie Harris for being such a wonderful guest today. And to all of you, if you could subscribe or follow or leave a rating, that is always so helpful and encouraging. You can follow us on Facebook on a journey at Journey to the Stage Podcast. Same on Instagram. You can follow me on YouTube as well. And all those links will be in the description. So keep your bags packed and join us on our next Journey to the Stage. And that is a wrap. Bye.